Hello and welcome back to Old Rope Salvage. I'm Lisa. That's it all for this. <gasps> and this is Tim. Well, let's have a cup of tea and think about it. And this is us in the cab of our 1975 Bedford fire truck. Last winter, we hired this massive barn on a farm, turned it into our workshop, bought this old Bedford fire truck, and began the questionable task of turning the old girl into what we hope will one day be our fabulous dream home on wheels. On a tiny budget, of course. Before all of that, however, we are undertaking a complete restoration and revamp of the vehicle itself. We've taken the whole thing apart, nut by nut, bolt by bolt. Is this coming off? Am I doing it the right way? So we can sort through all the many, many pieces and begin the process of cleaning and sanding, scraping and welding. And a salvage is our name, so salvage is what we do. So we're doing everything on a budget. Begging, borrowing, repairing, inventing, and of course salvaging as we go along. Last time you saw us, we were working on the stripped down cab, removing the old paint, and Tim was in the process of inventing the sandblasting kit, so we could remove every last bit of rust before we begin priming. What we've we got to do now is put the glass in there and see if this actually does not offend me. Tim had also managed to salvage an old gas oven, pleasingly grimy, which he planned to convert into an electric oven for some powder coating experimentation. In today's episode, I'll be taking a break from the workshop, but you can catch up with Tim as he switches the converted oven on for the first time. Give it a few more minutes yet, and then try it. And find out how he's getting on with all that obsessive paint removal. But first, here is the man himself with a quick update on why we've been away from YouTube for the last few weeks. Hello, uh, welcome back to the Old Rope Sandwich Workshop. And uh, first of all, our apologies for there being a bit of a break in our videos. And there's a, a lack of a Lisa beside me. No, she's all right. Yeah, we've had a little bit of a break. Uh, work's still been going on with the truck, as you can see behind me. But uh, we make these films for ourselves so we can look back on what we've been up to and our friends and family so we can keep them informed of what we're actually doing and also to anyone else who might be interested in what we're doing uh, which yeah, you could fall into any of those categories I suppose apart from you're not me oh no you are me if I'm watching me yeah. so uh, yeah and um, you know we try and make these quite uh, upbeat, happy films because we like to put a bit of positivity into the world. And, uh, and at the same time as that, you've got to be feeling it when you're making a film. You've got to believe, you've got to, you've got to feel it. And uh, we've had a little bit of a, well, a big loss recently with Mr. Frederick Pickles Esquire, who is a family member, a little furry family member who Sadly, we lost recently, um, he was a bit poorly and, uh, and he was a big part of, of us and it's very sad and uh, as being very sad, it doesn't really put you in the right frame of mind to be making films. So if this does get made into something, that means that Lisa is editing it and while she's editing it, she's going to be missing her assistant who would probably undoubtedly normally be sitting on her lap or on her computer and um, yeah I'm sure we'll be back uh, to full swing soon like I say the truck's still going ahead still building stuff and I'm trying to get bits of footage of it uh, I'm rubbish on my own though so um, yeah little Fred he's a, he's a big loss to us and, uh, well, enjoy the rest of this video as an update. Let's, let's look, not call it one of our normal videos. Let's just say this is an update as to what's been happening around here. And we'll be back in full swing very soon, hopefully. Little Fred. Fred! 
Good. video we talked about uh, all the ways of removing paint and rust which included um, scraping, paint stripping, wear protective gloves <laughs> and a hot air gun. I think that's about it and we will at some point do some sanding but we have got a couple of other things and one of my favourites is my most favourite tool we have in the workshop, the angle grinder. Probably, I don't know, this and a drill are probably the most essential things you're ever going to get. There's so many things you can do with this. Uh, and lots of different, not just grinding and cutting, but we've got some good, pretty good paint removal methods. We have the wire wheel. This is brilliant for removing all sorts of things. Uh, it gets a lot of rust out. We have uh, flap discs, They're pretty nasty looking flap discs. We've got another box here. These are like a sandpaper that's stuck on a little ring. And uh, they come in different grits, 40, 80, 120, whatever you want. And uh, these are like, these are really good for like metal and for like cleaning up um, welds or cleaning up bare metal. But if you use them on paint removal, they tend to clog up quite quickly. So we come to these. These are amazing for removing paint. You can use them on metal things and you can use them on wood. Uh, they're called poly discs. I think that's kind of what they're called. They're not that commonly available, but these are really cool. Love them. I, I've stripped down whole boats with these. Uh, they, they can clog up a, li a little bit, but uh, you just like knock it out. You don't have to press very hard either, you just have to put a light touch and they tend to last a lot longer. If you put too much pressure, it will wear them down quick and they don't tend to work any better. Nice light touch, brilliant things. Let's get going with them. Before firing up the poly discs however, and in my absence from the workshop, it was down to Tim to keep grafting away at the seemingly never ending task of scraping all the paint from every nook and cranny on the cab inside and outside and underneath too. Tim has always been a bit of a perfectionist, paying a lot of attention to detail, and in this way he is getting truly well acquainted with the cab, where repairs are needed, how much rust there is and what needs welding, all with the intent of eventually giving it the beautiful paint finish it deserves. The cab and quite a few of the parts, like this beautiful door, have been quite well stripped down of all their paint and bits and pieces now. We can start to get a really good look at it. But we're a little bit off repainting it just at the moment. First of all, we've got to tackle a few of the areas of rust. We're really fortunate there aren't that many, but uh, there is a few places we've got to get down and uh, looking at repairing them. And uh, the, both the doors have got quite a bit in them. And uh, that's what I'm going to be doing today. This is the ideal place where we get our blast in to see how well that gets it cleaned up. And I'm going to probably have a go at this and see how far in it goes. Uh, whether we, I have to make up a complete bottom and you know a big panel or whether by after cleaning it up uh, this edge is left here and I can like you know, we'll, we'll have a look. Basically, we're going to like clean this thing up and uh, and see what we're dealing with. 
We'll see what we got left by the time it's all cleaned up. Holes are getting bigger already. We haven't even cleaned it out from the inside. Mm. Right, let's get it in the blaster. Tim's homemade sand blaster, which was deputed on our last video back in March, is still in the process of being perfected. But we're optimistic that with a little more tweaking, our cheap and cheerful alternative to a professional sandblaster will not only save us a lot of money, but also do a fine job of preparing the cab and all its parts ready for priming. Work, sleep, repeat. Well, after getting myself a little bit cleaned up, I'm a bit undecided about that really. The sandblast it or vapour blasting, it's it's a bit slow, but then saying that it does really get it clean. So I might have to try maybe a few combinations of getting the wire wheels out and removing the worst of it and allowing this to just sort of get in the last bit. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see it, it turns the bottom of this into like a Swiss cheese. There is uh, multiple little tiny holes, but you know, you're right down to the cleanest metal, so I mean that's, and you can, yeah, you can properly see what you're dealing with. I've tried to get on the inside as much as I can as well, um, so it's quite good for getting in little tight, awkward areas. I don't know, well, just, and uh, yeah, all the way around here, uh, it's kind of, weirdly, although there's lots of holes that need, um, bits that need repairing, it's kind of almost encouraging because you can see clearly where it's good and where it's not. And uh, uh, these are going to be some complicated repair patches, I think. Well, there's a lot of angles in there. I'm going to be busy with a bit of steel and some hammers. But we'll have it looking like brand new. Alright. I had a go before with the blaster on this little area here and it did a good job but it was really slow so um, what I've done is I've stripped off all the paint off it I'm going to um, go over with the wire wheel attachment on the grinder and the poly disc and take out, uh, work on the little bits that are a bit more rusty go over the whole thing, see what it looks like and probably then finish it off with the blaster to get right in there and I don't know although this will be stripped right down to bare metal it'll give us a good idea of what we can use what tools we have in our arsenal a bit of an experiment Sleep, repeat. All I ever do is 
sleep with me. It's looking better. Those poly discs really are pretty cool. They, they get rid of paint really quickly and they don't tend to damage what's underneath, like the metal or wood or whatever you're uh, sanding down. It, it scratches it up a little bit, but it's very fine. So, yeah, like them. Uh, a little while ago, I fitted the element in the bottom. Uh, now we can... Uh... So, what remains is the electrics for it. Um, obviously it was a gas oven, now we put in an electric oven and um, I think what few people do if they ever convert these is they tend to use another oven for all its electronics and we didn't really want to get hold of a whole another oven so hopefully it's going to work but we've got a few little items here uh, this is a PID, a PID controller which is basically a temperature controller uh, it runs through a solid state relay that puts the power to the element and we also have then a thermo thermometer, thermocouple, thermostat, thermo thing. A thermo thing that tells you what the temperature is in the oven. So this bit goes in the oven, that tells this what temperature it is, this tells the oven where it heats up or cools down. Uh, all of these little, little items I probably shouldn't put in the oven because they might get a bit too hot. So I'm trying to find a, an enclosure, like a box. I'm trying to find a suitable box to put all of these electrical items into, which we can put somewhere on the side or the back of the oven. So yeah, i just got to work on these really. As soon as these are done, and it, you can actually see if the element works and the cooker actually does its job. I'm really excited. I have to want to see if this actually works. Of course it'll work. What could go wrong? I've been working on the electrics. I looked everywhere for a suitable container to put in the bits and pieces I need, which is only really this little controller thing and this uh, relay and a couple of little wires that got to be joined together. But I uh, couldn't find anything, so I just found a bit of scrap plywood and knocked up a little box, a little window for that's going to fit in there. And I've left the side open because I found this old heat sink thing so uh, that will just that will fit in there and it'll be exposed so uh, any excess heat will get let out and uh, well it's just about the right size for what I need so <laughs> in the end after looking around for everywhere it's like might as well just make something out of you know I mean I'm not sure about the colour really with the stainless steel of the oven it's not really quite right but you know <laughs> gets the job done so I just got to draw uh, some holes for the wires to come in through the back. A one from the oven, the uh, thermo thermometer, thermocouple, thermostat, thermo thing, couple, whatever it is, and um, recycled power lead. So yeah, I'll wire it all together, and next step I suppose is plugging it in and actually seeing if it works and working out with the instructions here how to work this little machine. I do hope on the other side it's in English because my Chinese isn't very good. Oh yeah, we got a bit of English. We got a chance. Jeez, a bit blunt. Second hand plywood. <laughs> Oops. It's alright, it's in the inside. No one will see that. Make sure these fit. Snug. Couple more then, we're good to go. cup of tea before I uh, pluck up the uh, courage to actually plug this thing in. Yeah, not nervous at all. We've got power lead coming in, power that goes to the oven element, thermocouple, all going into here, into the little box of magic. 
And uh, I really should read the instructions to work out how to set this thing. I did look. And then I forgot. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I plug it in. Or I'll fire the generator up, plug it in, and then see if the old element gets warm, I guess. I might give it a few more minutes yet, and then try it. Yeah. So I guess if I plug this in, and it all comes on, and I can work out how to program it, then that little thing glows orange, if I haven't broken it by bending it. Truth. Should have put an on and off switch, but I figured this is the on and off switch. <laughs> well, the good news is, it is definitely, definitely heating up. So far so good, I guess. Not been electrocuted. So the temperature is set to 100. And the current temperature is 14. So uh, the old red number should carry on rising until it reaches 100, then stay at 100. He's red. So why did I put all the electrics in a box? I figured um, it's better to put, put it separate where these can't get heated up than actually, you know, given that I've got a choice here, I can mount this on the side or on the back, or if I put it against the wall, I can mount it on the wall. And it gets all the uh, electrics away from all the heat. Had I have put them inside here, I was a little bit worried that it'd be too much heat coming up through the oven. It might not have been a problem, but you know, why take the chance? Well, it's going up. 50, 51, slow. 52, 58, 59. God, I wish our uh, subscriber count went up this fast. Right, I'm gonna say this is a success. There is something weird going on because as this senses it's getting close to its temperature that is de its desired temperature, like it was set on 100 degrees C. As soon as it got to about like 90, 92, it starts wanting to kind of reduce the amount of power a little bit so it doesn't overshoot 100 degrees and it takes a little bit longer it seems to get to that set temperature and the generator doesn't really like it because it's kind of asking it to pull electricity and then not and it's pulsing and I don't think it's working very well with the generator at that, fit, that point so I believe there are choices in this to change the way it sets sets itself so we can do it so that as soon as it reaches our temperature or a certain temperature we can get it to turn off so it's not giving us that uh, the PID part of this machine uh, when we connect it into mains electricity it'll probably run a bit better but I've upped the temperature now to 124 degrees C and it's uh, climbing again whereas it was starting to slow a little bit maybe we can set it to a higher temperature than we need and then back it off a bit once it's got there and then it'll keep at that temperature possibly a little bit of learning to do maybe but i'd say this is definitely it seems like it's working we got properly glowing element in there it's it's nearly 100 degrees c in there um we might have to move the thermocouple around a little bit in the plate in the oven to kind of work out you know where's the perfect spot for it to pick up the right temperature but at a minute anyway it seems to be working I'm expecting if we get higher temperatures, like the 200 odd or 190 degrees that we need for the powder coating, that we're going to start smelling some, some baking foods because there's still a lot of grime left in this and um, maybe I'll do it around lunchtime, you know, so that you start feeling hungry rather than sick from the smell. The fat's going to start melting, isn't it? It's going to start dripping out of the bottom. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, well, 97 degrees, uh, still climbing. I'll get, I'll get it to 100 and then put the, the uh, turn it down and see if it sits at that. But definitely, it seems like it's working at the minute. 
And the whole thing so far, because the oven was free, um, recycled like leads and power cables and everything. The, the element was about six pound, I think it was. That's brand new. And the, all the electrics in here, the PID and the relay and the thermocouple came to about 12 pounds or something like that. So the whole lot is about, our investment so far is, a, is less than 20 quid uh, and all brand new parts. So yeah, I think that's, that's pretty good. We got a, a really big oven. So what I've got to do now is go and make the, uh, the, the powder coating gun. I don't know what I've got left in the budget, probably about six quid. So uh, I'll go and go and make that. And then we can uh, try some parts. 100 degrees. All right, should just sit around that temperature now. Well, should sit perfectly at that temperature. And then I'll uh, check out what the actual temperature is inside. It says the back wall's 102, but uh, it went a bit over, so that's pretty good. 100 degrees. The, wall, the roof is showing 115, but that's to be expected. So the probably best bit is to hang some parts in there. Let them sit at the temperature and see what they are. And then we're uh, pretty cool. Right, better turn the generator off. We'll run out of petrol soon. All the scraping and cleaning up is pretty much done. Yeah, I was enjoying that until I uh, tilt the cap right up and then go, I missed a load of bits. Hooray! So yeah, underneath, uh, just when you think you've got it all, there's still loads of little bits and pieces. So I'm trying to take all the under seal off and clean it up. And then we'll be ready to um, clean it up a bit more with like the angle grinder and blasting it. But getting rid of all the under seal and all the residues and bits of old seam sealer. Uh, so there's still more bits to scrape out. God, like scraping must be like childbirth. You know, you go through it, it's agonizing, but something in your brain allows you to forget about it. And I think scraping is the same thing. Uh, I always end up to be like with a boat, with whatever it is, it's, uh, it's endless, it's endless. But it's good, it's uh, kind of getting there and I uh, can see where it needs uh, any repairs for welding and th things like that. Um, yeah, what looked like a really good cab, and it is a really good cab. It, once you start clearing out all this stuff, you kind of see the spots where you need to go and fix it. And there aren't that many, but there are certainly a few. So there's gonna be some welding coming up very soon. Yes, indeed. Next time on Old Rope Salvage is all about the welding something we've both been looking forward to for some time. And I will be back in the workshop as well, not only to earn my welding badge, but also to try and prize Tim away from the obsessive scraping. I'm sure we can all agree that it's gone on for long enough now. Tim, it's definitely time to stop.